Joe. Hello. Okay, we have a quorum, so I'm going to go ahead and get started with the um, script. So, good evening, Hopkinton. Welcome to the April 29th, 2021 school committee meeting. We are going to begin tonight with a, a quick, hopefully, joint meeting with the select board. And I thank all the select board members for joining us. Uh, before we begin, I do need to read a script for remotely conducted meetings. <laughs> As a preliminary matter, this is Amanda Fargiano, Chair of the School Committee. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Leah Batler Rafferty? Here. Meg Tyler? Here. Joe Markey? Here. And Nancy Cavanaugh? Don't see Nancy yet. Okay. Uh, staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Carol Cavanaugh? Here. Uh, Jen Parson. She won't be with us tonight. Okay. And Susan Rothermick. Here. Hello. And anticipated speakers on the agenda uh, include the select board members. Uh, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Brendan Tedstone. Yes. Irfan Nasrullah. Here. Amy Ritterbush. Here. Uh, Mary Jo Lafreniere. Not here yet. And uh, Brian Herr. Here. Hi, Brian. And Norman Kamala. Here. Thank you. And uh, Nancy Cavanaugh has joined us. Nancy, are you here? Yes, I am. Great. Um, this open meeting of the Hopkinton School Committee is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we are complying with the executive order that suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. All members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The executive order, which you can find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely as long as the public body makes provisions through adequate alternative means to ensure interested members of the public are provided reasonable access to the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting is a special meeting of the school committee and will not feature public comment tonight. For this meeting, the Hopkinton School Committee is convening by video conference as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Additionally, the meeting may also be broadcast by HCAM through one of its many channels. Please note that this me meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that others may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All supporting materials have been provided to members of this body and are available on the town's website via the web meeting calendar, unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda, unless I note otherwise. We are now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, I will invite board members to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until I yield the floor to, and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. After members have spoken, oh, we just, sorry, we don't have public comment tonight. So with that, I think we are turning to the agenda. And I believe at this time, I'd like to invite anyone who is able and willing to stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and, and to the republic for which, which it stands, stands one nation, one under nation, God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Okay, great. Good evening. We are going to start tonight with, I'm sorry, start tonight with our, um, joint meeting with the select board. And I would like to hand this over, I believe, to Mr. Ted Stone. We are going to be discussing the elementary school building committee number two. Thank you. So first of all, I'm gonna call our select board meeting to order. Uh, as a preliminary matter, this is Brendan Ted Stone, select board chair. Permit me to confirm that all members are present can hear me. Uh, members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Irfan Nasrullah. Here. Brian Herr. Here. Mary Jo Lafreniere. 
Amy Ritterbush. Here. Cutstone here. So, uh, Mr. Kamalo, if you would kind of take us through what we're here for tonight, and then we will, uh, we should, uh, um, Amanda, we should be very brief. And then when we're done speaking to you about this, uh, we will uh, reconvene on our own video, uh, our own Zoom link. So we will be out of your hair in seven to nine minutes. <laughs> Perfect. We're grateful for you being here as long as, as you will stay. Thank <laughs> so you. thank you for joining us. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Kamala. Yeah, good evening. Uh, through the chair, uh, as has been discussed in recent board meetings, shared with the Hopkinton public. Um, Hopkinton has been invited into the eligibility period by the MSBA, the Massachusetts School Building Authority. Uh, to that end, an article is now included in the special town meeting warrant uh, requesting town meeting approval of a transfer of $1 million uh, to be used for the development of a feasibility study. Uh, included in that article uh, is a reference to two things. One, an elementary school building committee number two. And, and then secondly, the spending authority for this appropriation will be under this committee. And thus, to that end, I'm asking the select board tonight to form that committee. Let me share with you too that included in your meeting packet uh, is a draft charge for that committee, a charge that was worked on by uh, Dr. Carol Kavanaugh, myself, uh, together with our legal counsels. Uh, it is a charge that is built on the framework that was laid out for the illustrious elementary school building committee that delivered Marathon School. Uh, we made some minor changes uh, that uh, we can discuss in detail if you have any questions. Uh, in summary, this is the 13 member committee of which seven members are members from the community with voting powers. The remaining six are pulled from uh, staff uh, in the district as well as in town government. Uh, I can also, with your permission, uh, ask Dr. Kavanaugh to lay out the vision for the committee. But again, in summary, it's a 13 member committee of which seven are community members with voting authority. Uh, it is a, a drawn purely, purely from the illustrious work of the elementary school building committee. And we're hoping that if the board is inclined to approve this committee, uh, we will move expeditiously to appointing the members so that at least when we get to town meeting, uh, we have a committee that is identified as the committee that will have the spending authority for the funds to be appropriated. So if you would like, I'm happy to share my screen so that anyone watching at home can see what the actual composition um, and charge document looks like. Thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh. Okay, so the the name given to this group is the Elementary School Building Committee too. We chose that name so that uh, it didn't tie us exclusively to the Elmwood School in the event that another project should develop from it. The 13 members that Mr. Kamalo spoke of are one select board member, the town manager, one school committee member, another school committee member who would be an alternative in the absence of the first, the superintendent of schools, the Hopkinton Public Schools director of facilities, the principal of the Elmwood School. The eighth is a member of the community who is knowledgeable in educational mission and function of facility. So we would be seeking an applicant with MSBA school building experience, school administration experience, educational facility management or facility management. The ninth is a member at large of the community, one resident, 
The 10th is a local budget official or member of local finance. Uh, one appropriations committee member is that person. Uh, one member from among the applicants with architecture, engineering, and or construction experience to provide advice relative to the effect of the proposed project on the community and to examine building design and construction in terms of its constructability. Um, again, that is a community member who has voting privileges. Uh, number 12 is a member of the community. Again, we would be seeking an applicant with communications, public relations, marketing, and or facilitator experience to provide advice on how to best guide the project through the necessary milestones and processes toward final completion. And then finally, the 13th member would be the school's director of finance. The purpose of this group Elementary School Building Committee number two shall be formed in accordance with the provisions of the town's charter and bylaws for the purpose of developing, evaluating, and if appropriate, advancing a school building project worthy of the town of Hopkinton, generally monitoring the Massachusetts School Building Authority, MSBA, grant application process, advising the select board during the construction of an MSBA approved project, and communicating transparently with the residents of Hopkinton. And the mission of that group would be to facilitate the development of a proposed solution to the operational and educational constraints of Elmwood School, as well as the district more broadly, with attention to enrollment growth, as well as academic prog programming needs, which will be supported by the voters of Hopkinton, as well as the MSBA. Uh, there are several tasks that we are, are giving to this committee, and I'm not sure if you would like me to read through all of them. I don't think you need to do that. I think. Um... The document is, is out there, it's public. Yeah. yeah. Um, so if I may, uh, Amanda, uh, I would like to uh, just simply move to number one, create a new school. Uh, actually, I will, uh, I'll, I'll accept a motion to create a new school building committee to be named and known as the Hopkinton Elementary School Building Committee number two and uh, adopt for said committee uh, the Hopkinton Elementary School Committee number two charge as presented and to authorize the town manager and school superintendent to post vacancies, interview candidates, and make recommendations for appointments to fill memberships of said committee. So moved. Second with some discussion, please. <clears throat> Mr. Herr, as you were. Uh, my apologies for not being there on the screen. I'm a little... I've had my second shot and I'm under the weather. <clears throat> um, so who appoints these 13 people? I think you mentioned it earlier, but I might have missed that. The select board. Okay. All set. Thank you. Okay. So uh, in question as well. Oh. Go ahead, Amy. Uh, I noticed that the school committee has an, a non-voting voting alternate member in case the first member is absent. And I didn't know if there would be value in the select board also having an alternate because it looks like a pretty intense meeting schedule and that one person might not always be able to make it. So Mr. Markey, uh, if I may, or through Amanda, uh, through the chair, if I may ask Mr. Markey a question. Um, Mr. Markey, you chaired the last elementary school building committee. Um, your, your, uh, your thoughts, I, I don't particularly think that we need to have a, an alternate. I think that the person that that was, I know that I took over the, uh, the select board um, representation from John Mosier. Uh, and I don't think that there was any type of uh, need for a second one, but um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Markey, your thoughts on that? Yeah, thank you. Um, as I look through the composition of the committee, it's, it, it's identically modeled after the, the composition of the team for, that we used with the previous project. Uh, we have an alternate for school committee. Uh, you're right, John Mosier was the rep for selectmen, and then you attended, Brendan. I, don't, I could probably count on my, on one hand, the number of meetings that combined you or Mr. Mosier weren't able to attend. So thank you for that. And um, you know, I, I think this this worked very well. Thirteen is already a pretty big number. Uh, we needed, uh, I think. Uh, a quorum of the 13 and then a quorum of voting members to, to pass things, uh, which was four. So we generally were able to achieve that. Uh, but this, this kind of project is gonna require attention, that's for sure. So it would be one that in, the, in our experience, we had 
great participation from from all of the uh, listed designated participants. Thank you. So yeah, I don't I don't see a reason to have a an alternate um, on there. So, um, so we have a motion that's seconded. Um, Mr. Nasrullah, how do you vote? Nasrullah, yes. Mr. Her? Her, yes. Ms. Lafreniere, it's not present. Ms. Ritterbush? Ritterbush, yes. And Ted Stone, yes. Uh, all right, great. Thank you very much. Uh, we, as select board members, are not adjourning. We're simply moving to a, uh, a, a different Zoom link for the Board of Selectmen to, uh, to finish up our meeting. Uh, Amanda, uh, Dr. Kavanaugh, and the rest of the school committee, thank you very much for having us. Uh, we're excited to get this committee underway and we're excited to get the, um, get the uh, school, if, if, uh, if decided that that's the, the route that the state wants to go, we're very excited to get that whole process underway as well. Thank you very much for attending and um, for the community, um, Sometimes it's unclear because we're talking about building a school where the jurisdiction falls. So I think um, it does fall under the select board and we really appreciate you coming to take this vote uh, in conjunction with us. I know Mr. Kamala and Dr. Kavanaugh worked very carefully on this charter and this um, committee definition. And um, I'm excited to get this going and move forward. So thank you very much. Great, thank you. So select board, I will ask you to leave this meeting and reconvene on the Zoom uh, link that was provided by Elaine earlier today. Mr. Tesson, just for one minute, uh, Dr. Kavanaugh, does the school committee also need to vote? Are we, we're done with item A on the agenda at this point, right? That is correct. Yes. Okay, great. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Have a good Thank night, you. everybody. Yep, you too. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we'll move on to reports. Um, Dr. Kavanaugh. I should not have given up my sharing of the screen. <laughs> I'll be very quick. Okay, sorry for the delay. This is the superintendent's report for Thursday, April 29th, 2021. Uh, as you know, we have had our grand reopening and I'm not exactly sure how grand it has been. I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, grades K to five returned uh, safely and soundly on April 5th, 2021. And I know we talked about this before. Uh, Mrs. Parson and I did tour all of the schools and um, teaching and learning genuinely look really like, like they typically would. Um, our kids are spaced in some places from three feet from edge of seat to edge of seat, according with DESE regulations. Um, but what you can see in these photos right here at the top, you can see the high school auditorium. As you know, they made their grand reopening of their return on Monday, April 26th, so just a couple of days ago. And you can see that the kids are seated every other seat in the auditorium. And this is just one of the larger classrooms that has been displaced. I believe it's a wellness class. And in the bottom right, I particularly like this, this photo because we were in a math class and a moment before this photo was taken, all of the students were facing forward and the math teacher was delivering um, whole group instruction. And then she asked the students to turn their desks momentarily so that they could collaborate on some work. And then shortly after that, they turned them back again. But you can see that they are able to do collaborative work even with the social distancing. And then finally, the large photo in the center is just the, the lunch photo. And this was taken at the Marathon School. So while the classrooms are looking fairly typical, uh, lunch is still very much distanced at six feet. So you know that we started doing our pool testing. And this is, this is a very important part of this presentation. What we really need is to get our pool testing numbers, our percentages up. Um, at this point, we really had a first round only about 20% of our families who had agreed to have their children participate in pool testing. 
And I know that there might be some misinformation out there because I think people have said, oh, I don't know if I want to put my my child's swab into a pool with others because in the event that one of those swabs turns up positive, my child will have to quarantine. That is not accurate. We are using a company called JCM Analytics and each swab goes into the lab identified with an individual student. And so if one of those swabs in the pool does in fact come up positive, they'll do reflex testing right there and they will be able to tell us which swab it was and therefore which student it was. So kids are not going to need to quarantine as a result of doing this. Um, there is no time on learning that's lost when kids come into the high school or the middle school. Um, if the doors open at seven or the doors open at 7.15, they go immediately in and drop off their swab, pick up a kit for the next week. And so then they can head to class. They're not missing out on math class or social studies or science or English. They are in class learning and the, the drop off and the pickup is pretty quick and pretty seamless. Um, what, what happens with pool testing is we are primarily using it to identify people who are asymptomatic positives. And so if we are able to remove asymptomatic positive people from our school community while they need to be out quarantining and isolating, that's going to make our schools um, safer. And, and that's, that's what we're looking for. What we really need is for families to say, yes, I will participate in this. And it really means that everyone is going to be doing their part. And I think that that is so important to mitigate risk for all. So for people who have not yet signed up, you can still do that. In the very first round, we had 592 students who had enrolled. Now that doesn't mean that we received a swab from every single one of them, but we got our first set of results today. And we actually did have two positive swabs in the batch. One was from the high school and one was from the middle school. Um, since Monday morning at 7.30 a.m., we have had 21 students test positive at the high school. And at the start of this meeting, I did get a text from our school nurses who are still working at this hour of the night. And we have more positive cases coming in right now at the, at the high school. Something absolutely has to be done. I know that um, and people are probably at home wondering, wow, is all of this transmission happening in the schools? What we can tell you in terms of timeline and in terms of the kinds of contact tracing that we're doing is these positives. And as you can see, there is an enormous number of them. They stemmed from behavior over the April vacation week. We really need for our high school students to practice COVID-19 safety protocols. We were doing great in Hopkinton for a very, very long time. And it seems like now our students have really let their guards down. You know, we, if you walk around town, you can see kids, they're riding together in cars, masks off. They are, you know, out walking around together, masks off. And we are learning from all of this contact tracing that people are in each other's homes, masks off. And a lot of socialization is happening because there are so many kids positive right now, that socialization is leading to more and more just the enormous spread of COVID-19 and more and more students testing positive. So of those 21 positives, these are not positive cases that were transmitted in school. Um, and this is, this is the part um, of this presentation where I, I actually spent a lot of time thinking about what, what we need to do. And I think that the district may need to be taking some bolder action. Several of the communities around us have transitioned their school districts to mandatory um, pooled testing. And, you know, typically you can't mandate pool testing for your entire K to 12 population because students are entitled to a free and appropriate public education, but you can mandate them for students who are doing extracurriculars. And so what we are considering now, especially at the high school level is mandating pooled testing for our spring athletes, mandating them for um, any of the graduation activities. Uh, we're, we're very worried that we are going to have kids who are taking part in some of those activities, whether it's um, an ice cream truck, the gala, the um, Fenway Park trip, and if we start spreading COVID in those events, we are not going to have kids who are able to sit on that field and graduate. And I know that this is a senior class that has been through an awful lot. They've been denied so much, but I do not wanna see a single student denied the, the right to sit on that field, receive a diploma surrounded by their families. So we are, are 
sincerely thinking about mandating that that testing. Um, I know it's been very controversial in other communities where it's happened, but given the incredible number of positives that we are seeing, and there are clusters in the community right now, clusters where people have gone to parties or clusters where people have eaten together or clusters where kids are just hanging out together, and we can identify those. And this is the kind of behavior that is going to preclude kids from being on that field at graduation. And, and it's, it's what we're asking for right now is, you know, another seven weeks or for the seniors, fewer than that of, of really good behavior and, um, and insurance that you're not COVID positive and that will happen through pool testing. So I will be communicating with Mr. Bishop um, and uh, Mr. Cormier about this relative to senior and, and some other activities perhaps at the high school as well as athletics. All right, in terms of quarantining, the guidance has changed. And I know that this was a, an issue for a lot of families today because what Desi has said is that, you know, we've reduced the, the social distancing to three feet from edge of seat to edge of seat, which typically puts kids about four feet apart nose to nose. And so our kids are in classrooms and they are, they're wearing their masks. Um, they're in the school buses, they're wearing their masks. And so what Desi has said is that in a classroom or on a school bus, if you're a student who has been exposed to a COVID positive student, you're still considered to be a close contact. We will call you a close contact. Our school nurse or someone else in the school community will call your parents and say, your child is a close contact. What we want close contact kids to do is to still get tested, to actively monitor for symptoms, to implement all of the other key health and safety practices, which means you know, being very safe when you're outside of school. But if you are a close contact and you are a close contact only in two settings, either the classroom or the bus, you still may attend school. This guidance does not apply to lunch. It doesn't apply to athletics and it doesn't apply to any out of school exposure. So if you were you know, attending a family party and you were exposed there, you would not be able to come to school. If something happened at an athletics practice, for example, where you were exposed, you would not be able to come to school. This applies only to the classroom and only to uh, the school bus. Um, and I just want to make sure that people know again that this is it, it, this is a DESI change in the guidance. So when people say, "How did this happen?" Uh, we we do have endorsement from our public health official. I did meet with Sean McAuliffe to see if he was comfortable with with this change, uh, but the the change did come from DESI. So just very quickly, we'll talk a little bit about MCAS testing. I know that we have heard from a lot of parents and guardians about the MCAS test. They're very worried about the time that's lost to learning um, for the MCAS. In grades three through eight, the recommended testing time is two to two and a half hours for ELA and an hour to an hour and a half of math. Now, when we say recommended testing time, what we mean is that the, the department asks the school to set aside that amount of time. So that means we're getting our kids situated in classrooms. Maybe they're sitting alphabetically. That means that we have given them the laptops that they need to start taking the test. Um, maybe it, it means that we're making sure that all the kids have logged on successfully. They complete the test. We complete you know, the, the testing make sure that they have you know, completed the testing and signed off of the laptop. And all of that theoretically should take two to two and a half hours for ELA and an hour to an hour and a half for math. Um, that's, that's a reduced amount of time for testing. And the department has done that. It's a modified MCAS test. And they've done that very purposefully so that schools are not losing a lot of time on learning for this iteration of the MCAS. Um, I know that people are thinking, well, why don't we just not do it this year? If the state were not to do the MCAS test, the commissioner would have to seek approval from the federal um, uh, Department of Education, and they have not done that. So we are on the hook to do MCAS testing, the modified version of it from grades three to eight. Now, we know that there are some parents or guardians who will refuse to have their child uh, participate. Just so parents know, we are not offering some other curriculum for that child on that day. So a kid is welcome to come to school and you know read a book or draw or do those kinds of things. But really, a parent or guardian may, may wish to keep their child home if the parent is sort of steadfast in their thinking that they do not want their child's testing. Um, I very often feel that you know kids who are sitting there not taking the test, you know, 
their peers know they're not taking the test, but, but also there's not much for them to do in, in that time period. Um, I understand that taking the MCAS test is very challenging, but everything about this pandemic has been challenging. And to be honest, for those of you who are naysayers, I just want you to know that the schools are doing our very, very best to ensure high quality instruction every day. And it's wonderful that we now have our kids back every single day. Um, but we are also required to meet the requirements of DESE. And we wanna make sure that our kids are getting the most out of their time in school. It's a delicate balance, but we'll be giving those tests and we'll be getting the kids into the testing and out of the testing in the recommended, hopefully time periods. It, MCAS remains an untimed test. So if any student needs additional time, they will certainly be granted the additional time. And just for people's information, I did put the testing windows, uh, it's made, 10th to June 11th for grades three to five ELA math and science, May 17th to June 11th for grades six to eight ELA math and science, and May 3rd to June 11th for high school ELA and math. Science will be, um, you, you'll get science competency determination through coursework at the high school. And that is all I have for the superintendent's report. Um, I just love this picture. These are, this is what lunch looks like at the Hopkins Elementary School right now. Uh, kids' names are on the, on the desks and the doors are open between the gym and the cafeteria. And that's what it looks like when you have about a million kids eating lunch all together six feet apart. Thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh. Uh, committee members who, uh, can, Nancy, would you like to ask a question? I, I do have a question. So I saw on there that the competency <laughs> determination has not been modified. Is that true for both the 10th and 11th grade? I had thought there was something for the 11th grade that was different. That is correct. 11th graders can use coursework to um, meet the competency determination. 10th graders cannot. So 10th graders will be taking the, the traditional MCAS, not modified. Meg, did you have a question? Yeah, I, I did. I just wanted to ask about the um, perhaps soon to be mandatory pool testing of certain groups. And you mentioned that there had been reluctance in other communities for kids doing extracurriculars to do this. And I just wondered why it, it seems so hassle free to me. I, I wonder if in, in other districts, if it's not, it, because they may be using a different product. So their kids, instead of having reflex testing done in the lab, they may need to quarantine. So that's, that's a huge concern I know for parents. Um, and then, you know, you may be called out of class to do those additional reflex testing if everybody is, is in school or you may be called from home to have to do that kind of reflex testing. I do think that there are people who are worried that their children who might be asymptomatic positive, you know, will sort of be found out. And I don't know if that makes, you know, people feel, you know, as if they've, they've done something wrong. And I mean, clearly if your child is asymptomatic positive, you had no idea, the, the pool testing is only helping. It, it, I can't think of a downside to using the JCM to do this kind of testing. I agree, I agree, thank you. Thanks, Meg. Joe or Leah? I think Dr. Kavanaugh answered my question as well already. But um, thank you so much for being on top of this. Um, I was wondering about the, the actual cases because, you know, thinking about like how long it takes from the moment you're exposed to actually getting it, it did seem kind of odd, the idea that it might be happening in the high school when they had just come back. So um, that was reassuring, um, but it's still very concerning. So if we do pool testing, do we have to vote? Or is that something that you choose to do at, at, the, at the individual school level? Yeah, Dr. Hannah, that was also a question I had. Is this something that needs to go on the agenda for next meeting or is we it? Could, it we could certainly put it on the agenda in conversation with our public health official, Sean McAuliffe, today. He did say that in other communities where they are doing sort of this mandated or required pool to testing, uh, what they are doing is sort of showing that the um, public health officials and the school committee are, are coming together on this with the belief that this is the right thing to do for um, keeping our public schools safer. So let's put it on for next week. I think we meet again. Yep. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay. I think that's it. Um, thank you for 
for all the details and the transparency and um, for being on top of, as Leah said, this, the, the testing and, and what we can do. I know my sons uh, in college, they do the swabbing three times a week. It's just what they have to do. It kind of becomes part of life. Meg, I'm sure you've had this. It, it, it seems to, when you start doing it, it seems like a, a really easy thing you can do that doesn't cost anything. It's easy. You drop it off. You just, it keeps everybody a little bit more, uh, a little bit more safe, a little more confident. Um, so, you know, I think once people get used to it, it won't seem like a big deal. Okay, we are moving on to new business, A, annual town meeting warrant articles, which was really the original driver for this special meeting tonight. So Dr. Kavanaugh. Sure. Um, so as you will remember, we had two different articles uh, on the town meeting warrant. Um, they are numbers article 13 and article 14. Uh, we originally thought we would need article 13 because we were looking at sort of uh, almost cost sharing, if you will, the, um, the budget deficit with the town. So we were going to take a portion of money out of the school stabilization fund and the town was going to take a portion of money out of the town stabilization fund. We were going to put equal uh, amounts in and that was going to budget balance the FY22 budget. Um, we have learned from our CFO, Tim O'Leary, that we no longer need to do that. And so the school committee, uh, may want to take a vote of no action on Article 13, which is your article. Um, the second one, Article 14, we had indicated to the community that we, we were a little bit nervous about the way we had conservatively budgeted this year. FY22 budget was, you know, sort of we were looking at the kids in front of us and then just the very small projection from Dr. Arthur Wagman. And our worry was that what will happen if kids return to the district from homeschooling um, or uh, private schooling placements and then they come back into Hopkinton and we have them and many, many uh, new students who may have moved into the community and we suddenly have this need to put teachers in front of our students. Um, so we were looking to have the town meeting at two thirds vote approve $500,000 coming out of the legacy farms money. And what um, in conversations with appropriations, um, they, they felt reluctant to say that uh, one particular municipal group was going to sort of have this almost slush fund to be able to meet its needs even though they didn't deny that our needs might be very real. Um, and another concern obviously is if you start to hire people, then what the, the people that you've hired now become part of that foundational budget moving into FY23. So we did take a look at our needs and then we realized that with the ESSER 3 grant, um, some of that money uh, that's coming from ESSER 3 would be able to help us meet those needs. And so it's our feeling that we probably no longer need to ask for this money from town meeting. And I don't know if Mrs. Rothermick, you would like to add to that since this is um, something that, you know, really falls into, you know, your department. Yeah, I think um, the American Rescue Plan, which they're calling ESSER 3, um, could be up to almost $500,000 allocation um, for the school department. You know, the town has a, a separate allocation and certainly staffing for unanticipated enrollment changes due to uh, COVID uh, would certainly be something that would be an allowable expense um, through that grant process. So we do still have a vehicle uh, to utilize if, if necessary. Um, so I, I think that gives us that, that comfort level moving into, you know, still what is an, an enrollment uncertainty year. Thank you. I think at the time that we were doing the budgeting and doing the articles, we didn't have an Elmwood school project coming forward. Mm -hmm. We were unaware of the ESSER 3 um, funding level and the magnitude of it. Um, and, you know, we have a lot on the table for the community at this town meeting and the special town meeting. So, um, my thought was to bring it back to the committee and just ask people at this juncture with the new information, with the ESSER 3 information and knowing that we um, definitely have a priority for this uh, 
for use of some of these funds for the Elmwood School Building uh, process for the feasibility study. I just want to see how the committee feels about this Article 14 uh, budget sort of stopgap measure that we were, you know, talking about. And I'll open it up for discussion. So, yes, it, it, all right. I, I'll go ahead and start. I I am comfortable with taking no action on on these articles in part because of the money that we know now is coming in. And the other thing is if there was some extraordinary need that should come before us related to growth, there is the possibility that we could go back to the town at a later date. Hopefully that would not happen. Um, but if that's what the appropriation committee and others are more comfortable with, I'm fine with that. Joe or Leah or Meg? Yeah, sure. It makes sense to me. Um, I think we, uh, as a committee, as you said, Amanda, we're doing our best to make sure our needs were covered without having full visibility into the revenue side. And in recent weeks, the revenue side has become more clear with the federal programs and how that impacts our town and our schools. So uh, with that new information, uh, I think it's right that the committee's re-looking at these articles. So I support the uh, proposal. I support the no action proposal too. I think those ESSER funds are a, a great gift. Yes. I, I think we were all concerned about using that money. We knew it might be possible to need it, but I think everyone was a little hesitant. Um, so it's nice to know that we won't have to um, pull on those funds for that. I'm, I'm fine with the no action. And I will just echo what uh, Nancy said that, you know, the town has acknowledged that if there is an emergency growth need, you know, we could always have a special town meeting if necessary. I mean, there's always that option if it's a real emergency. So uh, I will entertain a motion from anyone who would like to make one. I think we're looking for a motion to um, change our vote to no action on Article 13 because those funds are no longer being actually asked for by the town. They're no longer needed. And a, a motion for um, no action on Article 14. And that would be two different motions if anyone wants to start. So I'll make a motion to take no action on Article 14. Shall we start there? Sure. <laughs> We'll count down. <laughs> motion by Meg, second by Leah. And this is a motion to take no action on Article 14. That was the $500,000 um, draw on the stabilization fund for unanticipated growth needs in the fall. Any more discussion? Okay. How do you vote, Leah? Aye. Joe? Aye. Nancy? Yes. Meg? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. So that passes. Um, and is there a motion for Article 13, which was the sort of matching draw from our stabilization fund that would match what had been proposed for the town, both of which um, are being actually recommended no action because the funds are not needed? I make a motion to change our vote to no action for Article 13. Second. second. Motion by Meg, second by Nancy. <laughs> All right, how do you vote? Uh, any more discussion? Okay, how do you vote, Leah? Aye. Joe? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Meg? Aye. And I'm an aye as well, and that passes. Thank you, thank you, um, Ms. Rothermeck and Dr. Kavanaugh for bringing that uh, information back forward to us. Um, our, our last new business item is Special Town Meeting Article 2, the Elmwood MSBA Feasibility Study. Dr. Kavanaugh. Sure, so we are, we have a, a second article. Uh, we have an article, which is article number two on the special town meeting warrant. And that article is to 
uh, see if the town will give us, will vote by two thirds vote to take $1 million from the school stabilization fund. Um, and that will ultimately fall under the purview of the elementary school building committee too, when we get to feasibility with the MSBA in the event that we do in fact get that far because there is no guarantee that you go from eligibility to feasibility. Um, people may be wondering why we're asking for that money right now. Uh, we are asking for that money right now because in March of 2020, we submitted a statement of interest to the Mass School Building Authority for the Elmwood School. When we did that, we anticipated that we would be hearing from them in early December. And given the fact that we were in the throes of COVID at that point in time, the MSBA was unsure whether or not they would have funding, whether or not they would be inviting schools into the pipeline, so to speak. In April, we learned that they would be. And we learned that the Elmwood School was going to be invited into a period of eligibility. So there was very little time for us to prepare anything. So in an effort to make sure that we are ready 270 days from during that period of eligibility for feasibility to start, we need to make sure that that money is accessible to us in January of 2022. And so that's why we are asking for that money right now. I know it feels like we're asking for it very early, but this town meeting that's going to occur on May 8th is the only town meeting that is scheduled between now and January of 2022. Okay, and we had already voted the language of the article. Um, the only modification that was made by the select board, to my knowledge, is to just tweak the name of the committee. The committee, as you know, is called the now officially called the Elementary School Building Committee Number Two. So um, we don't have a need to revote that. We voted it already. Um, and there was some wiggle room in the language of our vote to allow for a minor adjustment, if you recall the wording. So unless someone feels a need to have further discussion on the article. I, I think that's all we really need to cover. Nancy? Just, just for clarification. So this right now, what we're doing is eligibility. The money does not get expended until we get to feasibility. And that if we get to feasibility, which hopefully we will, uh, the there is a portion of that, which will, even though we're asking for the million dollars, a portion of that would be reimbursed by the state if we're chosen to go into feasibility. Yeah. Yes. yes. If we advance, right? If we complete a project with the MSBA, yes. I actually do have a few slides if you would like to see them. Sure. Okay. How about five minutes tops? Five minutes tops won't take any longer, promise. And these will be the same slides or very similar slides to what you see at um, special town meeting. So that these are the, the things that people will be able to see so that they understand what they're voting for. And this is really an article that um, pertains to Elmwood School feasibility. Even though we're in eligibility, this is for feasibility. Of the Elmwood School, as I had just said, we were uh, we submitted our SOI in March of 2020, and at, we have been invited in. There'll be a 270-day period of eligibility, and that will lead to a period of feasibility. Our concern is, you know, uh, is around enrollment and space constraints at the Elmwood School, and I know that we've been looking at this for a very, very long time. Uh, what you see on the screen here are the projections from Dr. Arthur Wagman. If we look over here, he says that by the end of the school year, we should be at 4,000, I'm sorry, at the end of next school year, we should be at 4,024. We are pretty much already at that number in the Hopkinton Public Schools. Um, these 10 year projections are really important to us because I think that they're going to help us make some decisions about the Elmwood School. Uh, this is the preliminary report that was done quite a while ago. I think it might have been December of 2019. And um, what, what we see here is that the design enrollment based on MSBA guidelines and the square footage of the, MSB, of the Elmwood School at the time, it was really designed for 520 students. That was its capacity at the time. Um, the predicted enrollment for this year was 605. We are technically just under that. We're right around 590. 
And so we have added, to go from the 520 to the 605, we've added four classrooms which have absorbed these 80 students in here. If we believe in some of those maximum enrollment numbers, we're not going to be able to accommodate additional students with this, this footprint. But what you can see here are some of the other problems. In these spaces right here that are bright red, those are spaces that are for offices. And right now we have office space that is so cramped and we have some small um, instructional spaces here. This does not work for a school that could be as high as 600, 650, 680 students. You can see that the cafeteria is incredibly undersized. And these are things that you can't change. We also looked at the building condition. Um, so we had questions about why, why are we replacing Elmwood? Um, the school was built in 1964. It's the second oldest building in our district, but it's the one in worse condition. It's built on a Tennessee gas line. It contains significant asbestos. The cafeteria is markedly overcrowded already. If you continue to add students, I'm not sure where you're going to put them for lunches. The play area is too small to accommodate our kids and future enrollment. It's the geographical outlier. It had two modulars. We've added four. There really is no more room in that property for modular classrooms, for parking restrictions, electrical shortcomings, technology limitations, and as I just showed you, it desperately needs office space. Some of the instructional spaces that we are currently using, um, there's uh, instruction that happens on the stage. The OTPT is a split room. If you look at the ceiling here, you can see where we can just pull a divider across. There are two doors here indicating that this can be two classrooms when it needs to be. Instruction happens in hallways. Uh, we have makeshift classrooms inside a classroom. So if you need to have more space, we simply bought a classroom and we put it inside a classroom. Here, um, and this is this has actually been dismantled. This is a shared English learner classroom. Uh, they are no longer like this, but last year they used to be teaching on either side of this um, canvas divider. And speech and language instruction was happening. Obviously it accommodates four kids in one of those tiny spaces that was bright red and early slide. Uh, you can see that reading instruction, math instruction, a teacher's desk and stacks and stacks of level readers all happen in one storage space slash special education space. And this is just a, a, a heating slide here. The heat is fairly irregular. So you can walk into one classroom and see a space heater while you walk into another and see a window that's opened. Um, and here you can see Mrs. Carver is adjusting the univent because we turn it on and off depending upon the temperature in the room. Uh, we have now been invited into eligibility. Um, when we get into eligibility, we certify that we agree to play that by the MSBA's rules. We form our school building committee, which we get the charge to do tonight. Uh, we will complete an educational profile questionnaire and I highlighted some of these things that you see here. We'll be looking at proposed educational facilities, teaching methodology, grade configurations and program offerings. We will submit a summary of our district's existing maintenance practices. We will come up with a design enrollment for the project. We have to confirm that we have community authorization and funding to proceed. And that's part of you know, asking for this $1 million at town meeting. And um, then we will move to the feasibility study. An invitation to eligibility is not an, an invitation to feasibility. It does not guarantee that you are going into the MSBA's capital pipeline. And the, just these last couple of slides, we are requesting that the feasibility study, the $1 million comes from the Legacy Farms Host Community Agreement, such that it should not result in a tax impact um, immediately to Hopkinton residents. Why now? I've explained that the timeline of all of this has been very irregular and the period of eligibility lasts 20, 270 days, feasibility lasts 270 days, that's followed by a design period. Our building um, project manager told us that we would not be putting a shovel in the ground any sooner than July, 2023. So while it feels like this might be very rushed, um, certainly we are not in, in, in a hurry to get um, 
going on this thing in, in the sense of, you know, we're immediately jumping to a building project. Instead, this is actually a very measured and, you know, carefully run uh, process. And that is all I have for you. I hope I kept it under 10 minutes. I think I did. Uh, Dr. Dr. Kevin, can I just confirm, if we do not have a confirmed funding source for feasibility, we can't, even if we are otherwise looking great. We will not get invited in. Is that correct? That is correct. You have to show them that you have a funding source for feasibility. Yes. Okay. Which is another reason why this might be feeling rushed now, although it really is truly a, a measured and you know very level kind of process. I would encourage people to go onto the Mass School Building Authority website. They have a ton of information. This is a fairly new process for me personally. We're lucky we have a ringer because we have Joe, but, um, you know, just to really understand if you're concerned, if anyone has any concerns about the timing, the process, much of this is very prescribed by MSBA, which gives a lot of comfort for me personally. Um, these are taxpayer, Massachusetts taxpayer dollars. And so the MSBA has got to be very accountable for how this money is doled out. They don't give it to just anybody. We've been trying since 2008. So for this particular school, so, you know, you really do have to make a good case and, and um, really merit it. Uh, so once you get invited in, if you go to the, if anyone is, who's watching goes to the MSBA site and looks through the process, there is an enormous amount of de detail. You can start high and you can just dive and you can see deliverables at each phase. There are so many checkpoints. There are checkpoints um, with the MSBA. We have a, a within 12 hours, I think, of being voted. We had an MSBA project manager assigned to us who keeps on top of everything that happens, works with Mr. Kamalo and the select board and Dr. Kavanaugh. And so there's, there's a real rigor to this process, which I, me personally, as I'm becoming more and more familiar with it, it gives me a lot of comfort. So I do encourage the community, if you have hesitation about um, what feels maybe like a scramble to get in the gate, it's only a shifted timeline because of COVID. Everything that happens once you're in the gate is pretty slow and methodical. And I don't know, Joe, if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. Yeah, absolutely. You're right on. And same from Dr. Kavanaugh. It's a highly regulated process and very methodical. Um, I, the whole purpose of the Mass School Building Authority is to uh, provide oversight to tax dollars. So in the past, decades ago, there were cases where communities trying to manage projects of this scale on their own without professional project management and qualified, you know, architects and project managers qualified by a state authority, uh, they just ran into huge overruns. So um, you'll find as we go through this process that at every step, uh, the, the process and the method is designed to provide checks and balances to decisions that are made locally with uh, all the experience of the collective projects across the state over the past decade and more being brought to bear to provide advice at methodical checkpoints um, to the project that we would be participating in. So yeah, very highly regulated and methodical it can be kind of feel like a pain at times to be so highly regulated and methodical, but as someone who's fairly process oriented with phase gate kind of mentality, uh, I kind of welcomed the rigor of the process and thought it was very well done. And in the end, uh, in return for doing things the way the state uh, has prescribed is the best way to do it, um, you know, we get a lot of funding back as well for eligible uh, project costs. So yeah, I think you were right on in your assessment. And I think the website is massschoolbuildings.org if anybody wants to look at the process. It's all uh, very well laid out there. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone want to make any comments about special town meeting article two? Okay. Um, I, we're just about ready to adjourn, a uh, fun part of the night, but I do know that um, I think Leah wanted to raise a topic for the next one of our upcoming meetings. So Leah, did you want to share? 
Yeah, so um, one of the concerns that we've heard over and over again is about the mental health of our students and how, you know, coming back after COVID, how is it going to affect their mental health? Um, and so I was hoping that perhaps Dr. Kavanaugh, either at the next meeting or the one after, since the next meeting is only a week away, um, could maybe give us a presentation about the types of screening and things that they're doing with students to kind of make sure uh, they're creating touch points to know if students are starting to flounder or having any kind of problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fine. I think um, maybe we could even invite Dr. Zaleski because when when that legislation changed through DESE, um, I think she was instrumental in ensuring that those screenings were taking place as well. Um, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. And Joe, did you want to uh, have, suggest any topics? Yeah, I had uh, someone reach out and I think maybe they went to you too, Amanda. The Green Community or Green, Sustainable Green Committee, I think it's called, is looking for a designee from the school committee. So maybe we can put that on the agenda for next meeting. Yes, good idea. Yep, they, they did reach out looking for a liaison member from our committee. Um, we didn't put it here because it's a special meeting, um, but we'll do it for next week. Anybody else? All righty. Um, so we are meeting again next Thursday, and I will at this point look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion by Meg. Second. Second by Joe. Okay, uh, Leah, how do you vote? Aye. Joe? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Meg? Aye. And I'm an aye as well, and we are adjourned at 8.01. Thank you very much for squeezing this special meeting in. I really appreciate it. Um, I would like to say that this, some of us, I think Dr. Kavanaugh and I, and Ms. Rothermick at least, will be at the um, EHOP Know Your Vote which I believe is happening on Monday night. Um, and that's a great opportunity for the community to hear about all the special town meeting and annual town meeting articles and what's um, going to be voted on. And town meeting is May 8th. 8th. Uh, it begins at 9 a.m. and it's outdoors. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I'll see you next week. Have a good night. Good night. Bye. Thank Bye. you to HCAM. <laughs>